Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and we are continuing our 2023 series on municipal councils from across Canada, where we sit down with municipal councillors from across this great country to talk about their, themselves, their community, and of course, their duty to serve. Today on the show, we are welcoming two-term councillor for the city of Spruce Grove, Councillor Dave Oldham. Councillor Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. Uh, pleasure to be with you and looking forward to our discussion tonight. So let's get the party started with the question I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show. So you're no exception. Councillor, where's your sense of duty to serve come from? Uh, honestly, that comes from uh, my, my parents and my upbringing. Uh, lifelong resident of Spruce Grove. My uh, dad was a principal uh, at schools throughout the community. My mom, an active volunteer and worked in schools herself. And it's just kind of what we did as a family. Um, you know, so at a relatively young age, uh, that was that was kind of ingrained in me. And, uh, you know, uh, got into kind of some service work myself in various capacities and not ever knowing where that would lead and still not knowing where it might lead. Uh, this is currently part of that work, I would say. So, uh, yeah, it kind of right from being a young guy in Spruce Grove was part of our world. So in 20 and I'm correct me if I'm wrong here in 2017, you decided you would put your name for it your first time. And this is where you may need to correct me, uh, for politics. Um, Talk to me about the decision behind getting into politics and was politics discussed at the dinner table at, as a child or was it more of, OK, let's give back through volunteerism and let's give back through nonprofits or was the political route always in your destiny? Uh, it certainly wouldn't say it was in my destiny. And we did have lots of, you know, as a larger family, my aunts and uncles and grandparents, I remember being around dinner tables and more listening when I was younger, because I certainly didn't didn't have much to contribute. Uh, but as typical, I think, in those situations, it was political, or sorry, it was provincial, and it was federal politics, you know, the municipal politics wasn't very common around the dinner table. Um, so it was more maybe came from that service orientation and being part of the community. Uh, and in 2017, I actually was uh, through various things that I had done, I'd been invited to speak at a Rotary Youth event. Uh, at our local stage, just kind of as a guest speaker. And when I when I was done my little spiel and I went up into the crowd, uh, you know, you kind of the blinding lights as you go up through the stage and sit down just to kind of take in the rest of the show. And I happened to sit next to our mayor of the day back then, uh, Stuart Houston, who I knew a little bit and, you know, would kind of chat with once in a while. And uh, he was a very and still is a, a huge community supporter, so very active in our community. Uh, and he kind of gave me a little nudge. And is this was April of 2017. And he said, hey, you know, have you ever thought of running for city council? And I was like, nope, it's never actually even crossed my mind. And he says, well, I'm going to take you for coffee one day and we're going to talk about it and, you know, see if I can get you interested in that. And so I went home and just kind of said to my wife, I was like, hey, I said, you know, Stu, Stu thinks I should, you know, consider this and I might go for a coffee with him just to kind of hear more what he has to say. Um, and obviously that conversation led to me thinking more about it, but it really took me, uh, you know, another month to six weeks to think that I could possibly do it. And then I just started kind of consulting with some close friends who are active in the community to kind of get their gauge on, on, on their perspective. And uh, obviously then put my name in and uh, five and a half years later, here we are. So it's, it's been quite the ride. Was, was your political uh, journey started at that conversation or had you been involved in politics, whether it be helping out on campaigns in previous elections? Because I don't imagine there's just a light switch in you that goes off after that conversation uh, with the for the former mayor. Then you say, OK, Dave, let's put let's get involved in politics and let's put my name right up the top of the ballot first time out instead of maybe volunteering on a campaign and then putting your name for it in the following election election yeah honestly that was my first experience with what? any election in any in any capacity i had never done it before um and so you know part of that journey was finding people that could support me in that first election that had maybe run a previous campaign or were a little bit more involved in the politics of a community um and i was very fortunate to get uh, some really good people and tremendous support but yeah that was it that was literally the first kind of political foray of any kind was throwing my name in the hat and and figuring it out so uh yeah i, I still have lots and lots of fond memories uh of that first campaign and trying to understand uh you know how to connect with people at that level 
uh, and what was going to be important to our community, how to run a campaign. I mean, at the at the municipal level, I don't think you have to complicate it. I think it can be, you know, fairly simple. Um, but at the time, I didn't know that. So yeah, it was uh, a group of people for sure coming behind and supporting me and and giving me that opportunity. So let's talk about that first campaign a little bit here for a second. And I want to start with this question. You seem like you have a pulse of what your community wants. You don't get reelected by not knowing what your community needs and wants are. Were there things in that campaign when you were out door knocking, talking to people you had never met in your community? Because I'm assuming there are, your community is very large and uh, there's people probably that you have never met. Were there issues or concerns about the city of spruce grove that you heard that you went i didn't think this was an issue because it's not affecting me but i'm surprised it's affecting other people even my neighbors yeah absolutely and i mean spruce grove is roughly just 37 or 8000 people obviously not quite that many five years ago uh and what surprised me the most chris was kind of the issues in each neighborhood Right. So there's general issues in a community of Spruce Grove and there always will be and we'll work through those and the city evolves and we work together to try and solve those. But then there'd be concerns in Broxton Park or Mill Grove or wherever that were really important to maybe a couple hundred people in that area. Um, and whether it was, you know, something like, uh, you know, cats, cats being out in digging up gardens or something along those lines or 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 snow clearing was really important in one area because drainage is more of an issue because maybe they have older streets and the drainage isn't quite as good or you know I mean every community had I learned you know a couple of hot topics that were important to them um, so certainly at, at that micro level but then of course at that bigger community level uh, th there were lots of things that came up that uh, people were concerned about that, like you're right, hadn't hadn't occurred to me because it hadn't been an issue in my life to that point. You're the first person to say macro and micro issues that are occurring. But I want to ask this question to you because it's a very important question. In your five years on council so far, have you dealt as a councillor with more micro issues or more macro mm -hmm. issues? And do you find yourself trying to balance that out because you have to be there to move the, the city forward, but you also have to remember that there are micro issues that people have concerns about. Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say it's probably evolved, you know, and the pandemic, I think certainly affected that uh, pre pandemic. If, you know, if I was thinking there was probably maybe more micro issues. And I think also when you first get into this, <laughs> the micro issues are the ones that you feel you can kind of tackle, right? Because they're maybe a little more, uh, you can get your hands in them. You can ask a couple questions and you, you feel, and you are, of course, making a difference for people in your community and helping them understand. I learned quickly that one of my important roles was to be a, a buffer between kind of the regulatory process and how cities work and why cities work and the realities for people on the street and how they're living their lives and helping them understand, you know, how the system kind of works and how they can navigate it and, and get to a, a resolution. And sometimes the reality is the resolution isn't what they want or isn't the solution they want, but I can maybe help them understand why and listen to them and understand, and it, it can still impact future decisions, even though I might not be able to resolve the current one. And then I think through the pandemic, obviously, you know, the world shifted in terms of focus and was looking at some bigger issues as a whole, even if they weren't really municipally concerned, to be honest, for the most part. Um, and so now as we evolve out of that pandemic, if, if I can say that, uh, I, I think it, it, we're coming back into some balance there where people are now uh, more worried about some of the, the sidewalk clearings and the, the issues in our community, whether it's, and we'll, I know we'll talk about those later, um, that are community issues, but th there is still always room and space as a municipal councillor, I believe, to meet someone for a coffee, to meet them at their house so you can see how a bylaw is affecting their quality of life or their property or understand what's going on for them. So I think that's one of the unique things about municipal politics is uh, you know, we're not dealing with health and education and, you know, highways and things, but there are big issues for our community, but you can't get, you can't get so big that you're not worried about the people and what, how our bylaws and our, our policies are affecting them. Okay. You make a good point there. And I want to jump in on here for a second, because you say, well, mm -hmm. you are a municipal counselor, you're not dealing with healthcare and education or highways, but you are, let's be honest, your residents will come to you and say, okay, I don't have a family doctor, you need to help try and get attract more doctors to our community. 
How do you balance that? Because I can imagine it is challenging when you don't get the budget the provincial government gets. You don't get the budget the federal government gets, but you have to deal with the issues because you are the front line of services for your residents. And they don't care if you are a federal, municipal, or, or provincial uh, politician. You are there to represent them, and their issue is the most important. How do you balance that aspect of the job? Yeah, I, I think... What I try to do is in, a, in when someone messages me or stops me in the Safeway or wherever the case may be, I try to understand why they're trying to stop me. Some people are just needing to vent and they just are you okay with that? Listen. Are you okay with them actually coming up and venting? Because it seems like a very outgoing guy. Like I, I've only known you for 15 minutes now after our conversation via Twitter, but you seem like a very outgoing guy. And I can imagine you'd like to st stop and talk to people, right? Yeah, I have no problem with people venting because I, I don't, it's not a personal thing to me. And even if they're venting about a decision I've made or a choice I was part of in the community, I'm trying to understand their perspective. Um, th there's always something going on for someone when they're upset. And I try to get to the root of that, not kind of the, maybe the bluster that might come with it. And, and, and there's true frustration there and decisions that we make affect people's lives. Um, and so I have zero issue. Now, obviously, there are lines that that you know could and shouldn't be crossed. But to be honest with you, in my five and a half years doing this, and I'm fortunate, uh, maybe in lots of ways, but I haven't had anyone cross that line. Maybe in an email once in a while, but even then, they're they're not attacking me. They're attacking an idea, or they're attacking something that is completely out of my control. And so, it, I hate to say it goes with the territory a little bit, but. It's, it's kind of what you have to expect. And and in person and in the community, people have been uh, nothing but respectful, not always agreeing, of course, uh, but always respectful and willing to engage and and uh, have discussion. So I want to turn back to the, the very first election in October of 2017, that very first election where you were elected as the councillor for the city of Spruce Grove. Take me back to you walking into that ballot box for the very first time and seeing your name on the ballot, because I've had the opportunity to vote for myself and it's a very surreal experience. What was it like for you to see your name on the ballot and put that X or that check mark beside your name? It's it's interesting question. I have a vivid memory of walking in. I went to the early poll, of course, because that's what you do. <laughs> uh, you want to get your vote in. And I, I literally remember standing in line and it was, you know, a cooler uh, fall day. Uh, and so I was kind of bundled up, not intentionally. I wasn't trying to hide from anyone by any stretch. That's not what you do when you're running for an election. And I remember listening to the conversation around me a little bit and nobody said hi and nobody seemed to know who I was. And I didn't hear my name being being said by other people talking. And I was like, oh, I have no chance. Like, like nobody knew who I was. There's 50 or 60 people there. And, you know, these are just the games you play a little bit with yourself. Um, you know, as you go through this kind of a process, but well, at least, you know, yeah. you got one vote, right? At least you voted for yourself and you know, you have that one vote. I got the one. I, I was pretty confident in one and my parents live in town. So, you know, my wife was able to vote I, again. I still don't know if they voted for me or not, but uh, for whatever reason, I, I ended up with enough support to to get on council. And, but I do remember standing in that line kind of not second guessing because at that point you've been running a campaign for several months and, you, you kind of resign yourself to, you know, the results will be what they will be. And you've done the work to that point. But I do remember thinking to myself, wow, I, I wonder how this is going to go. So on election night, the results are coming in. You see your name start moving to the top of the ballot or to the top of the field. When it's officially called that you are the next councillor elect for the city of Spruce Grove, what goes through your head at that moment? I don't know, that's a good question. And it's, it's a little bit like, okay, okay, now what? <laughs> um, because, you know, you, you, and, and I said before the election, to the, the, my campaign team and my family, I said, you know, I am so glad I went through this process, because if, if I don't get elected, I feel really confident in our process uh, as a democracy, you know, going through that, I think when you live it, you really understand it. Uh, and if there's six better people in Spruce Grove uh, that the community's chosen with the effort I've put in, I can live with that. Obviously, you you, you don't do it to, you know, not get in. Uh, so I was really at peace with kind of however it played out. Uh, and then, you know, our, we have four or five polls here in Spruce Grove. So as it starts to roll in, you know, I was doing really well after a couple. And 
then, it, you know, it wasn't, it became a question kind of with my supporters that we had over to the house, not if I was going to get in or not, but was I going to be first or second or where was I, where were you going to fall? Right. And so uh, it was, it was exciting. It was very gratifying. Uh, and I was very, uh, very, uh, very grateful that, to everyone involved and, and obviously for the support. So when does that gratefulness become, oh God, what have I gotten myself into? Because you are now elected to represent the people of your city. And that means you are dictating what is the sort of the day-to-day budgets that they have to do in their own households, their snow removal, garbage pickup. If water doesn't get turned on, they're going to be calling you. What responsibility did you put on your shoulders to ensure that when you walked into that council chambers for that first time, and even to today, as we're talking, that you make the best informed decision that you're, you can go to your residents and say, I, I did my research, I heard from everyone, and I made the best choice for our city. How much of a responsibility do you put on yourself to do that every day? Yeah, I mean, it's it's significant, right? I mean, this is a community I grew up in. This is a community my parents still live in. I plan on probably living here for a long time and my kids, raising kids here. I'm active. I'm still active in the community with coaching and other volunteer things. So, you know, a municipal council, there's one hat I wear, but I, I'm, a, I'm an assistant principal uh, at a school in our community, just outside our community now, but I've been a, a, an educator here for a long time. And I've always seen you know, my position is it's temporary and <laughs> who knows what temporary really means in terms of length of time, but I, I will be a resident of Spruce Grove long after I'm a counselor in Spruce Grove. And so it's, it's my job and uh, to, to, it, it's, it comes down to uh, putting in, being willing to put in the work to understand how the system works and listen to a wide variety of perspectives. So you have a, you feel you have a good sense of the pulse of the community as best as you can uh and then you know be willing to make a decision and i when you're first on council that door knocking really helps because you know i I think most people probably door knock that are successful but if i hadn't done that and just kind of been able to get on i would have probably not really had that kind of foothold as to what i kind of heard from the community and i also want to give give a a huge lot of credit to the returning councillors in 2017 and 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 mayor houston who uh, who was back as the mayor because uh, they really there was four of us that were new in 2017 uh, and between them and city administration they were kind to us they let us find our legs i often refer to myself as bambi kind of out on the ice you know slipping and sliding around just hoping nobody would shoot me for the first little while uh and until uh until i figured it out and you you never really figure it out you just kind of get more experience that guides you and makes you feel more comfortable uh moving forward what was the biggest learning curve for you because i can imagine you're trying to figure this all out you have four other counselors as well trying to figure this all out for you though what was the biggest learning curve and what advice would you give incoming counselors who are just in their first few months in that first hundred days of office? Because in Ontario, BC, and even Manitoba, they all went through elections last uh, October and they're coming mm-hmm. up to their hundred days in office. What advice would you give them to say, this is how you do it uh, to make it a lot smoother for you? Yeah. You know what? I would share that uh, I was, I had the opportunity to sit down with George Cuff. Uh, who's kind of a municipal leader. You, you know that name, obviously. I grew up down the street from George. Uh, you know, he's from Spruce Grove. He spent most of his life in Spruce Grove, and I grew up on the same street as him. So when he learned I was running, he and I had several coffees. And so lots of lots of sage advice from George, uh, you know, to, to uh, listen to a variety of perspectives, uh, not come to quick conclusions too quickly without all of the information, because it's easy sometimes to hear one perspective and 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 you want to listen to that person, and then you kind of commit a, a, a not a vote necessarily, but a mindset or a belief system to that. But then you hear a divergent perspective, and it's like, oh yeah, I hadn't thought about that. But and, and an average resident can do that without really any consequence. But when you are a city councilor, when you're an elected official, you know, if I say to resident A, oh, I really like that idea, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna run with that. But then you get a, an opposite opinion from resident B, and then you've already kind of told resident A that you think their idea is good or you're going to kind of be in, be in that mindset. So, you know what? Uh, pondering is a word that George taught me. You do a lot of pondering. You do a lot of, you know, listening. Uh, my, my campaign slogan for both campaigns has been listen, learn, and lead, which I get is a little cliche and whatever, but it's literally 
if you're not listening, you're not learning. And if you're not learning, you better not be leading. And so lots of listening, uh, but also finding your voice because you, you people don't elect you to sit there and listen for the first hundred days. You've got to make decisions. That budget, at least in Alberta, I don't know what it's like in other provinces, that budget comes in for the following year, two and a half weeks after you're elected. And you're now helping helping make decisions on you know, a, a budget for an entire community. So it's finding that balance of figuring out your voice, but also kind of sitting back and learning about how a city works. Because to be honest, that's that wasn't my area of expertise before kind of, you know, offering too many strong opinions. After five years, have you found your voice? I think so. Yeah. And I mean, that's an evolving uh, process. Uh, and I would say, uh, and I, I've worked with wonderful counselors in both terms, um, you know, this time we have three new counselors uh, working with our, our city council. And so my voice and the purpose of my voice, I think, has, has changed over time. Um, but you figure that out and, um, and, and you make some mistakes along the way, of course. But yeah, I, I think I've been able to find my voice and where to have my impact and also where to sit back and listen to others because there's wonderful people I work with both in administration and on council that that sometimes I just need to listen to because I can I can learn I have learned a lot and will continue to before we turn to the uh second segment of the show I want to end with this sort of overarching question the personal toll that municipal politics takes on somebody is quite high because you are there in your community at all times. You're there, you're, you're in the grocery store, you're at the library, you're at the school, you name it, they can see you. Um, how do you balance personal Dave and counselor Dave? And how do you get personal Dave, assistant principal Dave, but also counselor Dave all separate? Because I can imagine people in your community will come up to you while you're at a restaurant with your wife and kids and ask you questions or in the grocery store. And I can imagine that might take a toll on somebody. I think for me, and I can't speak for anyone else, because everyone else has their own way to figure mm -hmm. this out. And it's this pretty personal answer, I think, for everyone. And that's why I like to I ask it. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You get a variety of opinions, I'm sure. To be honest, I just, I, I don't have personal Dave. I, it, really? It, I mean, I, I do in my house. Uh, I do on vacation. Um, but uh, between the various things I have I do and I've done, uh, I feel that when I leave the house that I am, uh, and people need to be respectful and people are, and I've mentioned that before. I have had zero issues out in the community with people being rude to me in front of my kids or anything like that. For me, the biggest challenge is juggling the time and the responsibility uh, and ensuring that there is, you know, a, 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 I'd call it balance, but sometimes it's not. And that's that's how life works for everybody, right? Um, but in terms of when I'm out there, personal Dave, I don't think really is, is a thing. And to be honest, when you're a teacher in a community, you also have to conduct yourself in a certain way when you're out of the grocery store and people are going to come and ask you. And I've been a, a long time coach in the community and, you know, people will be excited about the team winning or critical of playing time for kids or, you know, and when you're a teacher that happens. So, uh, and I kind of grew up with that, as I mentioned, you know, with my family being active in the community, I was used to going out and people just approaching my parents and approaching us. And so it, it's, it's not something that bothers me. Uh, in any way, uh, and mostly because people have been great. People have been really uh, respectful and, uh, you know, it hasn't been an issue. Abuse against municipal officials, elected and staff members has risen dramatically over the past handful of years. And to date, everyone has been dealing with these issues on their own and often on a case by case basis. While we can't eliminate all abuse of officials, we can take steps to mitigate the impact of those instances. On April 27th and April 28th, Strategic Steps Incorporated is hosting a symposium in Edmonton, Alberta, focused on bucking the trend. Attendees will come away with the understanding of fostering a safe space for both administration and council. Learn from industry leaders on how to deal with unsafe and abusive behavior, how to build a supportive team that provides support, and you can walk away with the tools and resources to help avoid abuse in local government. Get your tickets today at buckingthetrend.ca.
Well, that's good to hear. But I want to turn to the second segment now. And before I start this segment, I'm going to preface this by saying this is a conversation between the counselor and myself. If anyone has heard the many other conversations I've had with counsels, you know why I'm saying this, because this is his opinion. This is not a motion at counsel. This is not a policy of counsel. This is his opinion. We seem to get a lot of emails because of this question. Dave, in your opinion, right now, as of recording, what in your opinion, is the biggest issue facing the city of Spruce Grove today? The most immediate one is uh, an ongoing solution to helping our unsheltered population. Uh, you know, we're a, we're a suburb of Edmonton, as uh, you know, but may, may, many may not. And so provincially and federally, and this isn't a criticism, this is just how it is, is that we don't get some of those dollars that get earmarked for uh, affordable housing or shelters or other operational expenses or capital expenses to, uh, to, to assist our, our unsheltered population. And it's a, it's a, it's a growing population uh, in our community. I think the pandemic contributed to that, but it was also here before the pandemic. Uh, we have a significant for Spruce Grove, uh, uh, great people in our community that have stepped up and worked with the city, worked with our sheltered population, uh, you know, not-for-profit organizations, uh, faith groups, individuals, uh, and and we're finding, I, I think, our feet, if I can say, as to wh where, do, as a municipal government, we fit into that. Um, and so that would probably be the, the most pressing, significant one. Uh, there are other things that I think are important to our city, obviously, as well, but you know, day in, day out right now, uh, being January as well, it's uh, it's it's something that we're working through. So you 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 asked my question for me. Where does the city of Spruce Grove fit in that solution right now? Where does the city of Spruce Grove fit in the solution of when it comes to affordable housing? Because you are not the first councillor in Alberta across this country who has said unsheltered population and affordable housing are one of the top issues that are facing their communities right now. So how is the city of Spruce Grove addressing this? And how are you as counselor trying to move this issue forward? So it's not an issue in 2023 in next winter or 2024. So very recently, like in the last six months, uh, you know, th through a decision of council, uh, we opened up what's called a community hub uh, and and employed a few social workers, which isn't very common for a municipality because we're not in that industry. But there, there is a need here, right? And as the province and, and the federal government kind of figure out their role and how they can help maybe the mid-sized cities of the world uh, deal with that, you know, we felt that we needed to maybe step up a little bit as a council and we're very well supported by administration through that. So we do have a, a facility in Spruce Grove that's available from, you know, nine until five, extended hours sometimes, um, and then we've partnered with some organizations, uh, like I mentioned before, faith groups and not-for-profits, to provide uh, uh, what's called a late-night cafe uh, when it gets below minus 20 degrees at night. So, you know, in, in the really cold days in, in, in Alberta, uh, we, we do have, uh, you know, virtually 24-hour opportunities for people to stay warm and sheltered and, and fed. But the community hub is also... Uh, and this is well documented through council meetings and uh, and and you know different areas. You know it's working hard to get people connected to uh, employment, and there's an opportunity to help them with, them with a resume or get a, a social insurance number or some of those basics that I don't have the full understanding of. But to help people who are unsheltered make that next step forward and 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 get themselves to a place where they uh, can be more independent. Uh, we certainly have, a, a, our council has a heart for that, but it's not a simple solution. Uh, it's complex. Uh, reasons why people end up unsheltered uh, are varied, and we need to treat them as individuals. It's not the unsheltered population, that's the term I've used multiple times now, but it's John or it's Sarah or it's, you know, these are people. And we need to find a way, uh, you know, in our own way as a municipality to support them, uh, and we're working at that. You made a mention to the fact that City of Spruce Grove is so close to the city of Edmonton, and you are basically neighbors. You guys are divided by a little piece of property, but you guys are neighbors. How much 
of that neglect because you kind of said because we're so close to the city of Edmonton, we don't get the money for affordable housing for the unhoused population. How much the neglect and do you have to sort of punch into the provincial and federal government to say, guys, we're not the city of Edmonton. Just because people may look at us as a enclave of the city of Edmonton, we are not. We have our own unique issues. We have our own unique uh, uh, issues that we're dealing with, whether it be infrastructure, whether it be uh, affordable housing. How much of a pain is that for a city councillor like yourself? You know, it's part of our my responsibility and our collective responsibility is an advocacy in creating that awareness so that the federal and provincial governments understand that uh, there are those challenges and concerns in, in mid-sized cities uh, and in, in building those relationships, you know, being consistent with our messaging, being persistent with our messaging. You know, we're does it help that your local unique. does it help that your local MLA is your former colleague? You know, I, I think anytime there's a relationship there, it, it helps, right? And so, you know, the, the the beauty of maybe, you know, mid-size Alberta or whatever is, you know, our local MLA used to be on council. But, uh, you know, I think whether he was on council or not, and, and the previous MLA was not a previous member of, uh, of council, and we worked really hard to have a good relationship with her. So th- those things do help, obviously. Um, and uh, we want to work together with those levels of government to solve these complex problems because... It's not something that with a municipal budget we can do by ourselves. Now, we I want to go throw back to a uh, statement that you said earlier on in segment one of the show. And I want to balance the idea that if I go to your community today and I go talk to 100 people, they will all give me a unique micro and slash macro issue that is very important to them. You as a city councillor have to move the city forward as one. How do you do that when you have so much unique issues that are addressing your city when it comes to individual needs and wants? Because you talked about it a little bit beforehand, but I want to go into it a little bit deeper about the the unique idea that every citizen is has their own idea, own issue, but as the city and the city representative, you have to make the choice of who is going to get their issue addressed and who isn't. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, that's uh, th- th- that's the magic, right? There's always more ideas and more things to do than there is budget. Uh, and so part of it is taking the time to have conversations with people and explain the budgeting process, ex- explain the strategic plan. I was, We were, I think, as a council, really proud of the strategic plan. It was a very iterative process with our administration over several months last year that laid out priorities for 23, 24, 25. And that's very clearly available for us to reference and share with our community. And Do people that know about that? Document. You know, I think I think people know that there is a strategic plan and it's not their job. And again, I, I spoke earlier a little bit about that's my job to help them understand and show them where it is. So if they have a specific concern, I can point in the strategic plan to say this is where it's addressed. Uh, and within that, we we prioritized initiatives and, and ideas for 2023. 2024 and 2025. So I can then say honestly to a resident, that's something that we're looking at. We're not going to get to it until 2025 at this point. Uh, and here's why. Here's the full document. Uh, and I, I think people, in my experience, which is all I can speak to, appreciate someone that's willing to listen to them, to hear them out, to follow up, to, to gather information, to advocate maybe on their behalf a little bit. Uh, but I've also at times said to residents very honestly, like, I don't think I can actually take this to the larger group or take this to city hall on your behalf. Cause I, I don't know if I can find it in, in, in my priorities that it's going to be there. Uh, It a little risky when you say that to someone, but it's, but it's the truth. And if I go to city administration or my colleagues with every concern that's brought to me, and I don't have a bit of a filter myself, that's not serving our community as a whole. And that's not moving our city forward uh, we have made a strategic plan as a group of people. Obviously, that can be tweaked and adjusted and priorities can change. Um, but I think that needs to be the foundation for where we start. And then you have to be honest with people to say that, you know, we might not get to everything, uh, but, you know, let's set another meeting for a few months down the road and I'll hear you out again and 
things can change, but for now, this is kind of where it's at. And, 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 and having said that, I don't have to do that very often because most concerns, the strategic plan is broad enough that I can, I can say, well, here's where we're going to try and tackle this. And if it's more of that kind of micro uh, challenge that I'd referenced before, you know, those are often dealt with kind of, uh, you know, fairly simply without having to go into the massive concept of a strategic plan. Like the micro issues that I'm talking about are the potholes that are on the street, the sidewalk that needs yeah. to be fixed because everyone believes that pothole that's in front of their house is the most important pothole in the history of the world. And it <laughs> only needs to be fixed. How do you look at someone and say, I'd love to help you, but John's pothole on 52nd street is a lot worse than yours. And right now that one looks like it's about to collapse even further than yours. Is it hard to say, no at some sense to say i'd love to right now and you're not saying no i know that but we can't do it this year but if you look at our pothole repair a uh, placement plan yours is on the list it's just not as mm -hmm. urgent as it is other area in other areas i should say yeah and i think in in a governance role you you certainly i try at least anyway to stay away from saying that John's pothole is bigger than your pothole on your street. And I, and, and I try, but, but, but those questions get asked. So you're, you're right. You're right on the money in terms of, you know, that is a real thing. Um, I, I, I was a communications for a town. I know they're a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> they're real things. So there's processes in place. There's places to report this, um, you know, the pothole specific issue for a particular street or area uh, is certainly something that if you hear enough of, then we could make a policy change in terms of road maintenance or prioritization. But in terms of, you know, and I think this is where sometimes politicians, if, if I can call myself that, get themselves in trouble is saying, well, you know, John, who lives on my street, his potholes are bigger. And, and you, it, then it ends up being, you know, who has the contact to the, who has the counselor's cell phone number, or who has the ear of the counselor, they're getting their problem solved. And that's not fair to the whole community. So trying to stay at that, kind of b bigger level, but also still hearing people out and letting them know how their concern can be addressed and where to best address it to. I think there's a balance there and I, nobody, nobody nails it, but I, I try to think of it that way. Okay. Y you open Pandora's box. I have to play in it for a few seconds here with that last statement. And then we'll turn to the segment three because I am cautious of time here, counselor. Um, you're right. In municipal politics, sometimes it's who knows the counselors and who has the cell phone's number. You can pick up a phone and call them and have your issue heard, if not addressed. Now, not everyone knows each counselor. Not everyone has the ability to pick up that phone. How important is it for you as a counselor to continuously engage with your residents? How much of a communications, how much communications do you do with not people on Facebook, not people on social media, not people who have your cell phone number, the people who are just going about their day and are happy that their phone, their water's turned on, their garbage is picked up? I think as technology evolves and, you know, we, we move forward, you know, with accessibility, um, I think for the most part, you know, we're, there are ways for us to reach out to the community and there's ways for the community to reach out to us. And the question is always like, who should be, who, who needs to lead that? And I think it goes both ways. I think we as counselors and, and as and a council can reach out to the community, you know, when we feel it and you're a communications guy. So there are times to fully engage a community, whether it might be with a, a poll or open houses, obviously public hearings are, are formal ways, more formal ways to do that, um, legislated or not. Uh, and there are those mechanisms for us to reach out to the community. Um, but I also just think, you know, what the one of the best parts about being a municipal counselor is growing up in Spruce Grove and I'm at the gym with my kids and I shop at the local stores and I'm at the markets and I'm in Particip Park, uh, or it's not Particip Park anymore, Heritage Grove Trails. Um, and you're just accessible and like I said, when I leave my house, I'm accessible. And if people want to talk to me about something, you know, let's have that discussion or let's make a, a plan to have that discussion if it can't happen in the moment. Um, and so you do the best you can. Uh, I think politicians will always be criticized for not uh, getting maybe out there enough unless it's election time. And I understand that 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 uh, that take. 
because uh, I do knock on every door in the community during an election, and, and then I don't for three and a half years because, let's be honest, that's it's almost impossible <laughs> to maintain that that level of engagement. Uh, so you know what? It's it, it's an ongoing process that, uh, and I've I've my social media footprint, if you will, has evolved over time. Where sometimes I'm more involved, sometimes I'm less involved. Uh, so you you try and balance all of that uh, and and do the best you can. But it certainly is 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 not simple. So I'm going to turn to the last segment here because again, again, I'm cautious of time, and I I, I know you're a busy man. So I want to turn to tourism. Because we always remember that tourism is a provincial or a federal thing, but we often forget that there are tourists and tourist destinations in municipalities. So as a uh, uh, sort of a mention of myself, I'm planning to visit every community that comes on this show in 2023. So I will be in Spruce Grove later this year because I'm going to be up there actually in April this year. So I will be in your community. If I'm in your community, Councillor, what are the tourist destinations and the hidden gems that I should be checking out? All right. Well, I I, I look forward to having you here, Chris, and I'd love well, to sure show you around a little bit and, and I can show you the, the wonderful places that people can visit. Uh, you know, we have, and, and I'm, I'm going to be careful not to name them because I don't want to pick one over the other, but we have tremendous local cafes and home-based businesses and and gems of restaurants that are not, and franchise restaurants too, of course, and, and they have their place. But there's kind of a, a, a real unique culture of uh, small-based businesses here in Spruce Grove. Our chamber is one of the, because it's a regional chamber, Greater Parkland Regional Chamber of Commerce, is one of the largest chambers outside of the major cities, you know, in Alberta or Western Canada. Um, and so we have a very unique business profile that people can come to Spruce Grove and, and find some hidden gems. I'll take you to a few of them uh, when you get here if you want, uh, but I don't want to name one or two and then exclude others, you know, uh, uh, right now. Uh, we also have a tremendous park system. I, I call it Participate Park still because that's what it was called 35 years ago. Heritage Grove Trails that, you know, you can get in the trees where you don't even feel like you're in in a you know a suburban community. Um, and then lots of recreation uh, uh opportunities through uh, spray park uh, outdoor in April it won't be open but uh, uh, outdoor spray park uh, gymnastics uh, pickleball courts believe it or not that uh, attract you know what they, they've hosted the provincial championships and and major tournaments uh, that really brings people out uh, our horizon stage for the the arts community uh, a really great municipal library that we're actually building a second uh, second branch to in in an upcoming uh, capital build in Spruce Grove. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's lots here that that attract people, whether it's for a visit uh, and then maybe, hey, this is a pretty neat community. We're one of the fastest growing communities in Canada over the last 10 years. And I think as we've grown, we've become a place that's not just a suburb of Edmonton, but it's a bit of a destination for people to come. Uh, and, and our residents, obviously, we still use Edmonton you know, to a large extent for lots of things, but you can get a good meal, you can be entertained, you can go to a, a cocktail bar or live music, and and you can do all of that in Spruce Grove, whereas 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you really had to go to the city to to get a lot of those things done. We also have the furthest west uh, grain elevator in Canada, I believe, uh, that's kind of used as a museum now. And I've been fortunate enough, I was part of the Egg Society a couple of years ago and did some tours there. And some of that historical piece uh, to, to our, our heritage and our, our background is, is is a neat opportunity for visitors to Spruce Grove as well. Well, I'm, uh, if the museum is still open while well, when I'm there, I'm you need to take me there. That's all I'm saying. I'm a museum junkie and I could spend days at, at museums. But I want to ask the, I, while you said you don't want to pick and choose because you don't want to name names, I'm going to ask this question to you, though. What about yourself, though? Where do you go to decompress after a long day at work, after a long day at council? Is there a spot in town, whether it be a park, a trail system, a business or a pub or a brewery, and a, you don't need to name names, that you go mm. to decompress? And I'm going to say this because we always get this answer from councillors. You can't say your home because that's not, while it's in your community, it's not in your community. <laughs> All right. Well, for me, it's the it's the trail system. Uh, you know, especially spring and summer, I, I, I am an avid runner. Um, so I like to get out in the trail system or with my kids or with friends just for a walk. Uh, you know, I have lots of coffees with people, of course, through just friendships and, and lots of people that want to meet with the counselor for a coffee. 
and I'll say, Hey, why don't we go grab a coffee and then, you know, hit, you know, go through the heritage Grove trail system and get some exercise and get outside, um, you know, through the winter between council and, uh, you know, my full-time job. I also coach three basketball teams right now. So uh, downtime, uh, to be honest, my decompression time now is coaching my kids basketball. I, I truly love that. That's a lot, been a lot of fun. Um, so that's my downtime now. But once the spring rolls around and we can get outside a little easier, I'm a bit of a fair weather runner. So it's not happening now, but uh, we have a wonderful trail system and we'll do a coffee through the trail system in a few months, maybe. Will do. So my very last question before I do wrap up is this. Counselor, take as long as you want to answer this question, but what makes the city of Spruce Grove such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Hmm. Uh, it, it's the people. I mean, and, and, and that, that might be a bit of a generic answer, but when I think about, you know, my youth in Spruce Grove, going through the school system, being involved in the community, um, you know, there's a tremendous uh, underground group of people, above ground group of people that makes Spruce Grove just a wonderful place. There's generous businesses, there's unique opportunities, there's tons of volunteers, uh, you know, there's people that want to step up uh, through other work I've done in my life. I've, I've, I believe that people want to make a difference in the world for the greater good. Sometimes they just need to know how, where, why, and who to trust in order to do it, whether that's at a global level or, or a local level. And I think as we evolve as a city, we're, we're starting to do a better job of figuring out, and we always have, but it's, it's, there's never, you never get to the final point of building a city. It's, it's an evolution. Uh, and I think we're really getting to a place where you can be involved and welcomed to be part of our city um, and not for everybody. And I'm, and, and, you know, I, I fully admit I have a lot of privilege in my life and, I, and I've been given a lot of opportunity through that. So we need to continue to do work so that those opportunities are available for visible minorities and, uh, you know, people that maybe not, can not always have that opportunity. Um, and, and, and we are doing our, our, our best to continue to work at that and, and find that, but you know, it's, it's a great community because of the people. Dave, Councillor Oldham, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and pleasure to have you on the show to talk about the city of Spruce Grove, but also yourself. Uh, you, uh, I always say municipal politics is always the forgotten politics of our country, and we need to change that. So hopefully these conversations will start that conversation, and hopefully we can start bringing some of these municipal issues to the provincial and national stage. So thank you so much for being part of the series for me. You know what, thank you for putting a spotlight on municipal politics, because like you said, and for good reason, sometimes the, the attention goes elsewhere, but uh, I've truly enjoyed my five and a half years to this point on council and I uh, have certainly learned a lot and I'm grateful for lots of opportunities, including the one to chat with you a little bit tonight. So I appreciate you reaching out. Well, thank you so much. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews. And as I always say before we wrap up every interview, put down social media. Go have a conversation with somebody. You'd be surprised that it can help us. It can help our democracy and help our society be better. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.